Life is hectic, demanding, and doesn't stop. When honest with ourselves, we must confess we often don't know what the hell we're doing. The LARCast is an ongoing conversation about the inclusive and mischievous nature of God's presence. Through the lens of all the things that make up this phenomenon we refer to as life. Astonishing grace and refreshing honesty collide right here for your weekly encouragement. Welcome back to the Lark Cast. You guys are in for a treat today because the Lark Trio is in the house. Russell, Jameson. Yeah. Hello, yeah. gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning, fine sir. How are you? <laughs> Good to see you guys. It's been a minute since we all all hopped on on a Lark Cast together. And um, you're listening to this on a Tuesday, but we're recording on a Friday. So it's like Friday vibes in studio yep. today. Mm. Yeah, man. All over the U.S. And um, man, I'm, I'm, I'm hyped on today, dude. Um, the Menzingers came out with a new album today. Philly punk rock. I'm about that. My son's got his last game of the regular season in football. They're going for nine and oh tonight. It's going to be 55 and raining. So it's going to be just like a gnarly, like wet, muddy slug fest with this like heavy running team. And so are we. Um, it's going to be, it's going to be good. I'm hyped, dude. We're recording the Lark cast. And uh, yeah, I'm just excited for today. We're, uh, I'm in Atlanta right now in my brother's house. And tonight we're going to a high school football game as well that is Boom. allegedly number one and two in the state with the number one quarterback recruit in the nation playing. Dude. And I What's don't know his what his name, name is. Um, I have talked to my brother for about 10 minutes so far, so I don't know. <laughs> All right. But that's where we're going tonight. And then starting tomorrow, Lark Tour in Canton, Canton, Georgia, kicking off. Dude, that's amazing. Dude, we actually kick off thinking about it. Like we've we've got an, an an additional stop on the Lark Tour, man. It's kicking off for a big shindig tomorrow evening, and then another one can on Sunday evening. Yep. So two stops, two stops, new faces, new friends. I'm stoked, man. Y'all are kicking it off with that Botox party, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we've been saving, saving for a good while, man. Russ, so, tell him to really focus on your forehead. Yeah. <laughs> I talked to him about it, but they were like, well, it kind of starts right here above your eyes, and it just goes all the way to the back of your head. So you got that, gonna be you got a little, that leathery, be a little pricey. You got that leathery Florida skin. <laughs> yeah, man. It's uh, it's definitely... uh gonna be some good times man i'm excited Dude, about it that's there's awesome. a festival going on so tomorrow morning i'm heading over to the festival um so spencer who runs reformation brewery invited us out for this particular weekend because there's gonna be all kinds of people all over the place vendors are gonna be out there's gonna be food everywhere and you know if you don't know anything about reformation brewery they were a part of making craft beer a real thing in Atlanta or in all of Georgia, they help make it possible in the state. So um, we're going to hang out with him and celebrate and just kick it around for the day. I'll be here or I'll be there all day tomorrow. And then driving to what's that town, Russ, that we're headed to tomorrow night. Warner Robbins, Warner Robbins, yep. going to a backyard cookout with a Boston butt. And the guy said, he's got a whole, whole plan. So bro, he's, He's smoking a, a Boston, Boston butt, for us. butt. Yeah, man. The hell is that? Been Sounds serious? good. Jameson doesn't know. Do you know, Russ? Yeah, dude. It's no, called barbecue. Don't. It's called <laughs> Boston bar- butt. Yeah, it's just a name for the cut. Ah. So you've you've anytime you've and been to know a, what a, y'all a barbecue were restaurant. That one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we were 
exploring fundraising routes these days. And... <laughs> Botox and Boston butts. And... <laughs> uh, but on a serious note, yeah, it's just if you've had barbecue, then you've had a, you know, you've had a Boston butt. So yeah, man, we're uh we're we're heading up. And bro, my my wife and my little dude are joining me on this leg of the tour, man. Oh, dude, that's awesome. Which yep. has never happened before. So we're actually hopping in the car here soon and driving up, man. Dude, that's amazing. I am uh I'm my six year old that... my six year old requested uh beef jerky for the road and pickled okra. And when he asked if we could get a jar of pickled okra for him to snack on in the car, there was like, you wept like this. Yeah. It's like this sense of completion just like came over my body. I was like, this is, this is my son and whom I am well pleased. (laughs) Dude, that's awesome. Well, man, I'm, I'm bummed. I'm not going to be able to join you guys for this this part of the lark tour i'm trying man i just want to let all of lark nation know i'm trying um you we know, need all gotta, lark nation speaking of to go ahead and get on tony's instagram account and give get him, him some shit give him some yes. shit get him there yeah grief lots of grief yeah. and guff <laughs> i uh yeah i just got a lot going on football with Our- the fam and you know um fall break starting and and stuff like that and a small business i'm trying to get off the ground so i'm trying hard i'm trying hard i'll be out there i'll be out there soon yeah man because our 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 faith in the gospel man it has its limitations (laughs) we we have to know when to when to stop trusting jesus and when to start just busting your balls Mm -hmm. (laughs) no i get it it's a fine line (laughs) <laughs> My balls are, you know, they're open for busting. They always have been because the Lord Jesus knows I bust a plethora of balls. What? What a word. <laughs> a, oh, myriad, a myriad. A myriad. Some would say. Yeah. A plethora. A plethora. <laughs> I like this. All right. So. Um, we're in Galatians. Um, it's been, it's been going great. We're two, two episodes in this is the third and, um, we're going to be finishing out chapter one. Maybe we might be doing a a couple in, in chapter one, but before we get into that, I'm going to spring something on you guys. Uh, this is something that we played last night as a family. Camden brought his new girlfriend. My oldest brought his new girlfriend over to the house last night. We met her for the first time and we played this and had a lot of fun. It's called mind meld. All right. You guys ever heard of mind meld? No. Nope. Okay. So basically here's Sounds how complex here. Here's how it goes. Well, sure. For this people is who idea. overthink shit, it's probably <laughs> really hard. Okay. So for you, Jameson, <laughs> it might be. I've never heard this one before of Midwesterners liking games. <laughs> going. Dude, I'm usually like a game hater, but this one's fun. Give me like about a month and I'll be like, yeah, I'm done with this. So basically on the count of three, we're going to count down. We'll go three, two, one, then say it. We all just say a word, a noun. And then from there, we have to work to find the common denominator between those words. And then the hope is that we will land on the same word together all right those all right. are high hopes how long did it take you last night what was your record what, what was my record last night yeah um well we're doing it with three people so it's a little bit more difficult i got it in two last night with pam on one of them but it's typically like three sometimes four if you're really slow you know so what you're telling us is that because Pam's not here, we're at a disadvantage. <laughs> All right, so mind meld. We're doing this. We're absolutely freaking doing this. All right, you guys got to get on here, Pam. 
feel like I'm getting a short end of the stick. <laughs> you guys got a word in mind? Hopefully. All right, got, wait. All right. Got it. Okay. Three, two, one, tree. Phone. Crank. <laughs> Did we okay, do it right? I said phone, and you said <laughs> crank? I said Frank. Frank? Like, <laughs> is this a friend of yours? You said noun. Did you not? Like a hot dog, Frank? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> this is a postmodern era. It can mean whatever you want it to mean. <laughs> Let's go with hot dog because, bro, I love I love hot dogs. Okay, so Frank. tree, Russ is what? Phone. Tree, phone, and Frank. Yep. Okay, you guys ready? Three, two, one. Picnic joy. food. Okay, so picnic, joy, and food. Yep. Picnic, joy, and food. We're in our lane here, dudes. We can work, we can work with that. Picnic, right. joy, and food. Ready? Okay. Go. Three, two, one. Friends. Laughter. Eat. Friends, laughter, and eat. Okay. Freaking, <laughs> we got this. Okay. <laughs> We freaky got this. There's what so common pressure. denominator is found? Sync, sync with me, dude. I'm probably gonna be done after this. Eat. You guys can do the rest of the podcast. Sync with, <laughs> sync with me here. Sync with me here. This is perfect. All right, I got Three, it. Three, two, one. Lark, lark. lark. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Dude, that was perfect. <laughs> we did not plan that. They say great minds think alike. Great minds think alike. There it is. So take that game. Play it with your friends. Play it with this your family. A... Play it with your neighbors. Play it with random people you meet in and the if places you're looking, you go. And if you're looking for more on the topic, we will have a new blog post about missional minds. <laughs> Mind <laughs> Dude, that's a booth at Exponential, bro. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Please, somebody a of mileage. don't do this. That's a booth. That's a brand. That's like um that's like a missional brand right there. No, what's missional, in, missional what, innovation, what, right? What it is is an indicator of just how sad the <laughs> church world has become. Grace bombs. Oh man, don't get me started on that one. Yep. Yep. All right. S speaking of I was don't I was get not optimistic about that. So I'm in, I'm impressed that we did that. You like that? I'm going to watch good, that man. one. I'm going to go back and watch that. Yeah, that was that was like that was perfect. <laughs> okay. That was perfect. All right, so what are we getting into here today? Galatians. Galatians. The Galateans. The Galateans. Galatians. Yeah, Chapter man. 1. I think we're around in verse 11. This is Paul's, where Paul's getting rolling. Paul's about to defend himself a little mm -hmm. bit. Defend. Yeah, we've covered. Refute. Yep. And we've hit, you know, we've explained the doc, the donkey doctrine that Paul's reacting against and then we talked a little bit about the drama doctrine that he kind of throws in the face of the donkey doctrine mm -hmm. last week um and this i think we already said it but this is the most intense moment in paul's writing um in this book but i think this first chapter is particularly intense so we're getting paul's true colors here and it should say something because when he starts off this letter, right? Like he, he, he hammers on the cross. The will of the father is the giving of the son, the taking away of sin. <laughs> and so as we press in now on these last, I don't know, what is it? Six, seven, eight verses of chapter one, he goes into his story to essentially kick it back in their face and say like, no, 
the people telling you I'm not an apostle and that my gospel is not legitimate, um, I'm going to go ahead and tell you how legitimate all of that is. And the way he does it appears to be self-referential. Mm. Like, um, which is something like if you're in a good debate class, they're probably going to be like, yeah, you can't do that. Um, sure. Come from the standpoint certain... of your own story. Yep. Yeah. And so that's what we'll get into. Should we read it? I, yeah, I was going to, I was going to see if you guys wanted to read the whole friggin' thing or summarize. I mean, I don't have like, you know, a condensed summary ready to roll. But yeah, man. it's a lot of verses. I'm okay. whatever. I'm down. Jamie, you're getting ready to read. I shouldn't have interrupted you. My my it's all good. Apologies. Oh, apologies. I'll just ready. do it. I'll just do it. Yeah. So in verse starting in verse 11, he says, Now I want to make it quite clear to you, brothers, about the gospel that was preached by me, that it was no human message. It was not from any human being that I received it. And I was not taught it, but it came to me through a revelation of Jesus Christ. There it is. That's the circular reasoning, as some would call it. Mm. You, how, do you, how do you argue with that? Right? So verse 13, you have surely heard how I lived in the past within Judaism and how there was simply no limit to the way I persecuted the church of God in my attempts to destroy it and how in Judaism, I outstripped most of my Jewish contemporaries in my limitless enthusiasm for the traditions of my ancestors. But when God, who had set me apart from the time when I was in my mother's womb, called me through his grace and chose to reveal his son in me so that I should preach him to the Gentiles, I was in no hurry to confer with any human being or to go up to Jerusalem to see those who were already apostles before me. Instead, I went off to Arabia, and later I came back to Damascus. Only after three years did I go up to Jerusalem to meet Cephas. I stayed 15 days with him, but did not see set eyes on any of the rest of the disciples, only James, the Lord's brother. I swear before God that what I have written is the truth. After that, I went to places in Syria and Sicilia and was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which are in Christ. They simply kept hearing it and said, the man once so eager to persecute us is now preaching the faith that he used to try to destroy. And they gave glory to God for me. Mm -hmm. Hey, go back and read that Cecilia one more time. Cause I read it as Cecilia too. Like, isn't there Did a song like, Cecilia, you're breaking Cilicia. my heart. Cilicia. Cilicia. But that's funny. You're right. Because I read it, I read it like that too. Because we read the beginning and end of words, we don't actually read the middle. What? <laughs> how does the song go? Cecilia, Cecilia you're, breaking you're breaking my heart. My heart. Galatians, oh. you're breaking my heart. <laughs> this this whole scene right here is evidence as to why that game that we played earlier is gaining traction. Yes. <laughs> It's so funny when I heard you read that. I was like, yes. <laughs> Cecilia, Paul and Cecilia. Every now and then, folks, we get on here together and try to read the scriptures and look for moments of solidarity with one another and our ability to not read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's his it's his defense and his, you know, argument, his refuting. You know, it's kind of doing, it's kind of doing, doing double duty. And, yeah. um, it's, it's a bit of a, a hard pill to swallow. Cause he's literally saying that he spent time with the risen Jesus like yep. three years. Yeah. That's the part I think people don't, um, understand. At least well, I don't, it, I don't it, understand it either. Well, I'm not. I don't mean understand like the <laughs> the, the that mystery. Like, that's the part the people don't understand. Uh, I mean, uh, I only spent a year and a half with Jesus. Got this on lockdown. <laughs> uh, what I just meant is, um, it's it's less of about understanding and more like just informative. Like like uh, there's a misunderstanding about the length of time, 
right? We when when I have conversations about Paul learning from Jesus in in my mind and also in the minds of lots of other people that I've talked with over the years, you kind of have this like, oh yeah, there was this conversation that they had on the road, you know, there was this sure. blinding moment and Jesus, you know, sat down and had supper with him and they talked for a little while and you know that was it. It's like no 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 this is this is three years Jeez. of being taught by Jesus. And everything he's saying and everything that he's written is all in accordance with what Jesus, we have recorded in, in accordance with what Jesus himself has declared. And also in a, you know, full accordance with John and Peter and James. And so, yeah, man, he's, he's spitting truth, but the, the validation behind his position and his authority over the matter is irrefutable. Yeah. It's a, uh, this isn't a guy who's looking at you and going, look, man, there was, a, there was a there was a crew of people over here that that thought I was a good teacher, man, and said that I should do this. This is, mm -hmm. I read a few books. <laughs> it's like, no, Jesus himself sent me to, to teach this, and I'm teaching you what he taught me. So one of the um, questions, you know, that I have of, as I've been um, kind of digesting this passage and this whole scene, even a little bit later on, he's going to talk about you know, he's going to reference the time that he brought Titus, you know, to Jerusalem to meet with all the apostles. And really this kind of argument about circumcision, law mm -hmm. and grace comes to a head. And you can read that in Acts 15. I believe that that's where that's at. Yeah. And there was this whole like, you know, public discussion, argument. And Paul says, you know, the way it was presented, like Titus, th though he was a Greek, he wasn't persuaded to be circumcised at all, like not even for you know, a minute, um, <laughs> meaning like grace is so good, you know, like it, it's not even like, it's not even like an option or even a question. It wasn't even up for, you know, even consideration. So these Judaizers, they come from James church in Jerusalem. And then Paul's just like, you know, diametrically opposed to what these guys are saying, like his gospel, which comes from Jesus. The question I have is like, man, what was kind of going on in Jerusalem to where like they were kind of like letting this fly a little bit? I wonder if there was, you know what I'm saying? I wonder if it was really mm -hmm. tumultuous in Jerusalem, um, you know, that these guys would gain traction because it doesn't seem like they were like completely rogue because it even says in Acts 15 that they had to kind of convene and have a conversation about it. Almost like Paul kind of like brings them back and corrects them. So then that leads me to, you know, think of one thing like, Dame, dude, like what was going on in Jerusalem? There might have been some some drift, you know, going on there as they were trying to like really bring the gospel to a primarily Jewish community that had to have been like insanely difficult for sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's pretty that's pretty wild. I think it's really hard for us the same now as then to to be okay with just having a self-referential truth claim like the gospel like we 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 choke on that stuff because there's there's no proving it you know there's no like all right here's the formula you just need to say this right and then it's going to go it's going to work it's going to do its thing it's going to convert people or it's whatever like yeah. no Paul is very clear. I got this only through a revelation of Jesus Christ, meaning the one who is truth is the only one who reveals truth to anyone. And I think that when your in, entire known history as a people, like, like the Jewish people, is it's it's almost completely intertwined so that it's recognizable only as a system and a, a belief system with the practices and with all of the things that go along with their faith that you read through, you see in the old Testament, right? Like that's almost inseparable for them. Like the things that we do are a part of who we are. Hmm. And that's a truth claim. That's a particular way of determining and naming truth, right? We, we are who we are because of what we do. We're the people of Israel. So that's what this, here's what that means. All these things that we do, mm -hmm. um, which 
I have to, I want to put a little note in here. We got a couple accusations for being um, anti-Semitic based on our last couple episodes. I don't know if you guys saw that. And there's a huge and significant case for anti-Semitism in people who teach some of these things. Sure. Um, you know, Martin Luther, I think, gets a, a good dose of that. Um, but I want to say, if we were unclear, I'm sorry. I don't think that we were. But the clarifying thing is, I don't think that Israel, as a nation, throughout the history of our scriptures did anything inherently ever for me to be like, yeah, I'm anti-Israel or I'm anti the Jewish faith or, and here's probably the key. Like, I think the accusation about anti-Semitism is about you're saying that the entire religious system is completely worthless and Jesus dumped all of it and said, it's all bad. And I'm like, no, we said he fulfilled it. That's very clearly what, you know, we're, yeah. we're pointing to. And that's this conversation. <laughs> it's been fulfilled and not in a way that it's gone or irrelevant. It's just completely been moved. It's it's it was in the wrong place in the minds of many of the people in the Jewish faith. And then they were imposing that wrong placement upon Gentiles, people who were not Jews, but were coming to faith in Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so they're kind of like saying, well, if you want to be a follower of Christ, you have to become a Jew. And there was yeah. one person on the Instagram who said, and this is, I don't, I have never heard anybody say this. They said to be a Christian is to be completely Jewish. I was like, I don't really know what that means. Um, but that's one of the things that were, it was a reaction to our podcast here. Yeah. It's uh, I'm, I'm going to, I see what you're saying. I, I found myself just kind of going, okay. Um, so we're, we're holding up and rejoicing in a savior uh, who is Jewish and we're doing our best to teach the beauty of what the Jewish apostle Paul <laughs> has declared in this letter. And then it's, well, this is, you know, anti, you know, you're anti-Semitic and it's like, okay, that's just ridiculous. Um, but <laughs> I just, I, mean, I could go on, yes. but I'm like, <laughs> it's so <laughs> ridiculous. Know, it's ridiculous. But, but here's my point. Their, their thing was, was the debunking of, of the law. Okay. And all the rituals saying that these things are of no value, which is what Paul was saying. These things are of no value in regards to your union with God, because your union with God is something that God has single-handedly gone on and done in and through his son, because you and I or anyone else who's ever walked the earth was never going to make the ends meet. Okay. Um, and so we've always been pretty plain, pretty clear. You could say his, you know, these rituals, yeah, they were a beautiful thing and they were designed to point you to someone who's coming to be, right? The fulfillment of that. His name's Jesus. That's happened. This law, yeah, the law is good. It's always going to point to where harmony is found. It's not going anywhere. We're not anti the law. That would just be absolutely foolish. It'd also be extremely foolish to think that this law is somehow something that's needed to live into in order to live in union with God. And so we have to put the law in the right bucket. And that's what mm -hmm. Paul's doing. He's not throwing it out the window. He's putting it, he's putting ethics, you could say, in the right bucket. And so I think when you listen to like some of that pushback, you, um, it's start to me, it starts to get to the question, Tony, that you were originally asking it starts to reveal like the the human condition as to why the drift mm -hmm. why was there a drift that we can see in acts 15 why were so many people choosing to go back to slavery under religion who have already been set free in jesus why would you willfully sign up for that and then sign other people up for it yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, there's go ahead. There's Jewish people, right? Then there's Jewish culture, and then there is the religion um of these people and of this culture that Paul summarizes as Judaism. He says, like, you guys know of my history as a Judaizer, right? Yep. And when he discovered the power of the resurrection, Jesus who raises the dead, not improves the approvable. In Philippians 2, he runs down all the things that he was trusting growing up in that religious tradition that originated from those people in that culture. And he goes, dude, I had a I had a stellar resume. Born of the tribe of Benjamin, all about your origins, where you came from. Circumcised on the eighth day, boom, right out of the gate, introduction mm-hmm. into a life of the law. As to the as to the law, blameless. And he goes, I counted it when I met Jesus. When I had my interaction with him and I understood a righteousness that comes from him, not my two bit bullshit righteousness that I'm mustering up in my heritage, lineage and behavior. Right. right? And my religious practices, he says he counted his former righteousness as a huge pile of cow shit compared yeah, right. to the righteousness that is in in Jesus. And that's not you cursing. That's the actual it's word, the word that the Apostle Paul <laughs> uses in yes in there the greek new testament yeah it's a hundred percent in there so i just think like dude like on social media people are just gonna let stuff fly because there's just no accountability except for do you remember that one time that dude came out on our podcast (laughs) art (laughs) yeah (laughs) this dude was like oh look at these bearded hipster pastors with their overpriced bourbon and look at all cool and this and that well what this homie didn't know is in his link in bio. He had a he had a link to his personal website with his cell phone number on it. So we started getting a this, lot of larks started calling him. <laughs> <laughs> we started hitting this dude up, tagging him on Instagram, and then I was texting his phone, dude. Yeah. Needless to say, his comments disappeared. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, that was I, that was funny. It's such an important point what you're saying, Tony, and the language is, he says, you have surely heard how I lived in the past. Yeah. Right. Like that phrase should tell you something about Paul, what Paul believes the place of the law is. He's like, I'm not living the way I did. And he's referring to his adherence to all of the systems inside of the Jewish religious faith. And I think one really important clarifier is I don't believe that every person that was an Israelite throughout the course of Israel's history was a a legalistic, crazy person. Right. And I think that's where for sure, like people who accuse you of anti-Semitism, I think that's part of what they're accusing you of is you're saying every person, the whole system, all of it was <clears throat> everyone was totally legalistically minded. I'm like, I I don't think that. I just think there there are streams of extremism inside of anything, any religion, any system or whatever or culture. Right. So I don't if we did sound like that, it's not what we intended. I think what we're saying is no, there are ways of viewing the law and the Ten Commandments, especially, that turn them into the very thing that they were set up to be a, opposed to you shall have no other gods is not a demand for you to go and get it straight. It's a promise about where you find life. <laughs> That's yeah, it. I'm going to take it. I'm going to take it a step further and say that when you look at the the pushback to me, that's you see the issue within humanity in this person, myself, right? People throughout time. And it, it it sheds light on exactly what you're seeing with these people, the Judaizers and everyone who was grabbing on to what they were saying and even enslaving other people to it. The, the, the person who's coming to us and saying, I've got a real problem with what you're saying, and when you look at their comments, what is it they have a problem with? Well, they have a problem with the fact that we're saying what Jesus said, we're, we're saying what Paul's actually teaching here in Galatians, and it pulls the imaginary platform of control right out from under their feet. And they don't like that 
because people want a means for control, not a God who invites you to let go. They're two different things. One is an invitation to find your 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 everything, okay, in your nothingness, you could say, in Jesus, to be completely and fully lost in his life, to no longer need to define who you are ever again. Man, that is a boulder off the neck of anyone who's willing to say Jesus or bust. But if you're not there, if you're still hanging on to control, well, you want you want to be able to take this law and find a way to interpret it, okay? To interpret it in a way that you can return it to the realm of the possible. Exactly. Right? Yep. You yep. want to turn this thing into something that's manageable. Mm-hmm. And then, therefore, you're going to have a problem with anyone who's sounding off on, hey, this thing you're holding up, that's not it. It's not possible. Jesus already fulfilled it for a reason. But man, again, if you want control instead of Christ, you you can't get there. And so you've got to find a scapegoat. You got to be able to, and if you can't attack what we're saying, well, then you've got to attack the messenger. I mean, you see that in the political world everywhere, right? When you always know when someone doesn't have a real base to stand on in their argument when they start attacking you. Because again. I think they uh I think they listened to the podcast and and they were forced to look in the mirror. Well, like the to rest be of honest, us. I think they listened Hard. to the real. So yeah, they got correct. about 58 seconds <laughs> and they I asked them, I was like I hear you. I don't think that's at all what we're saying and you you should check out the the rest of the show and maybe the rest of some of what yeah. leads up to it, you know. But here's like what you with what you're saying, the next the next step of it. When you're looking at Pauline theology, like from even higher up, looking the the broader scope, here's here's something I'm reading in Douglas Campbell that I'm like, this is exactly it. He says, We must resist any challenge to prove or demonstrate the claim that Jesus is Lord is true on any other basis than its own i'll read it again we must resist any challenge to prove or demonstrate the claim that jesus is lord that that's true on any basis other than its own and i think like galatians chapter one is case in point like paul is saying there is no truth that's true without jesus being lord the crucified one who was sent by the father to take away the sins of the world for his pleasure. (laughs) Yeah. That's the truth that is at the bottom of all truths. When you start adding all of these other things back into it, you're adding criteria above the truth. So the truth is no longer the actual foundation and the basis, but your criteria for determining what's true, for determining what you're Mm -hmm. supposed to do for things that make truth true. You can't do that. That that fundamentally denies who Jesus is. So that's far more dangerous. Far more dangerous. Yeah, because you start enslaving others. And your unwillingness to go all in on Jesus' reconciliation of all things. Mm-hmm. Okay? So the garden, you trying to be God. Um, in so doing, you you start to enslave other people to the criteria, which means they never get to the truth, which means they never get to freedom, which means they never get to love or life. The very one that God has given them. So I get why Paul is, is adamant here about this. Where you actually end up is functional atheism. Yes. Yep. Yep, you you're declaring one thing, but you're living as if something else is reality. Functional atheism. Yeah, man, it's it's like a there, there's like an encouragement in looking into it 
But then there's also like this really stark warning there. Because you go, man, if, if people that close to the day of Jesus walking the earth could drift that far, that fast, well, what does that mean for us today? Right. Yeah, and some people would even argue, you know, um, if you want to call it Judaism, by the time Jesus shows up was a far departure, you know, from, you know, its its origins. You know, they 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 took these, you know, beautiful things, right? These pieces of the mm -hmm. furniture and started just adding, you know, all kinds of, you know, stuff to it. No one drifts towards the gospel. Yeah. You know, we were just driving that home in episode one, and this is just, you know, we're seeing it play out in real time in the first century and in and among, among people. And I think everyone can, you know, attest to that in their own heart. Like, I mean, it's just so crazy how my mind and my heart drift towards, you know, tit for tat, you know, theology when it comes to just my relationship with my wife or my relationship with my kids or uh, my friends, um, my relationship to my own self, you know, um, and a life of trust sometimes just seems so foreign. And I'm like, man, dude, I've been at this for so long. Like why? Like I'll finally get around to reorienting my mind just to trusting really just in simple ways. Like even just as a business owner, as a person, you know, just an individual with everything going on. And I'm like, dude, like, like I've been worrying about this thing for like weeks, man. Like, it just seems like now is the first time I'm coming around to just like trusting actually. So it's, it's real, dude. It is absolutely real. Yeah. I, with what you're saying, Eugene Peterson's got a quote I want to share. It's, it's in his book about Galatians. He says, we have been conned by our society into thinking that in ourselves, we are not worth much. And so must prove we are something by what we wear or what we produce or what kind of impression we make. Then we are introduced to God's truth. We are loved and forgiven. How do we make the transition from living our habitual guilts and rejections to living the freedom and acceptance which now surrounds us. I circled that one because I'm like, man, that feels like the question at the heart of so many of the conversations we have. You know, most of the people we talk to aren't fighting theological, theologically with us so much as they are wrestling deep in their heart and soul to actually believe the message of Jesus to be true. Right. And I'm like, that's me. I'm in that camp. I'm, I, I don't automatically believe this stuff. <laughs> I'm yeah. full of questions and doubts and anxieties and man, but to hear Paul say, yeah, Moses didn't reveal this to me. <laughs> Jesus did. I mean, that throws the whole thing into question. He's like, yeah, it wasn't Peter either. Mm. Or any of these. It wasn't Moses or the apostles. It was Jesus himself. Two things. And then you guys kick this around. Number one, I'm like, that's a revelation. That's a really specifically personal and unique and unprovable experience that Paul had and shared that's a B is more of the question in it which is like I don't have a lot of experiences in my life that I would call revelation on that level mm -hmm. right um where G where I would say that was the face and the voice of Jesus speaking to me about himself which can lead me down the road of questioning if I'm genuine <laughs> in my faith and belief or, or I just get all up in my head and then go and try to prove that God is real or Jesus is who he said he is or all those things. Like that's kind of where a lot of the tension ends up happening in my life. I think, what do you guys think about that? I never yeah. dealt with anything like it, but <laughs> well, I mean, you know, Jesus, impervious. <laughs> Jesus prays. I think it's in the upper room, you know, like, um, 
he was praying for the disciples and and everyone else who was going to believe because of their word. A lot of us stand downstream of this apostolic tradition and these like real interactions in history with the with the risen Jesus. I think Paul's was unique in the fact that he spent time with him, you know, post cross and post resurrection. Um, but if I look at like my own story and how my just, you know, unbelieving rebellious heart was turned in a, in a soft and gentle way, uh, and it, through much violence, you know, <laughs> the, the hound of heaven as Spurgeon puts it, you know, mm-hmm. just kind of tracked me down. You know, he was always there, always reaching out. And I would just, I would just suppress the work of the spirit mm-hmm. in my life, dude. You know, I just wouldn't want anything to do with it. I just wanted to be, you know, I wanted to control my own life and that expressed itself in rebellious, rebellious ways. But I would, I genuinely tell my story. Like I met Jesus in, in 2000, like the way that he revealed himself without any words, without any conversation, you know, to my mind, to my heart, he invaded, you know, and I love Michelle's or however the hell you say that dude's name, his point, the word on revelation is apocalypto. Like it's an invasion. Yeah. Like he invaded my freaking story, dude. Intervention. You know? Um, you know, broke through, you know, the dullness of my heart, the hardness of my heart, the unbelief in my heart. And and softened it to to really see um man, just the foolishness of my, you know, controlling unbelieving ways and turned my heart and melted my heart, produced repentance because of his kindness and his forgiveness. And so I, I genuinely tell the story like, yo, I met Jesus in 2000 on route 231 in my 1993 black Ford Ranger. Like that happened, you know, that happened. Um, but it, sometimes it feels, you know, like, a um, a circular thing. And sometimes that, that doesn't connect. So I know we've oftentimes said like, man, here's the best way just to have conversations with our neighbors. is just through our own stories, but some people don't have those experiences. And especially as I was pastoring, talking to a bunch of kids who grew up in the church, dude, they're just kind of like along for the ride. Most of which like, you know, a lot of, you know, people in the Jewish tradition as well, they would hear these stories of Moses or people who had interactions with God. And they were just kind of like, cool, I'm just trusting, you know, this thing. So it's not what Paul is saying, the real source of truth from the capital T truth himself, you know, written down in, in the scriptures. Like that is sufficient, man, you know, but, um, Mm -hmm. I've often wondered about this connection between Paul's story and really having like a moment where, you know, we feel like the, you know, the spirit spoke to us in relation to deconstruction, because I think a lot of people who are deconstructing and walking away from everything right now, uh, I don't want to speak for, for everybody to say that they didn't have like genuine experiences, but I think a lot of people just had a relationship with like the church. Yeah. They just knew the church. Wow. And when you come to find out that the church, right. And it's all of its flaws and uh, the whole system and structure and the institution of it is just bunk, you know, and BS, or it doesn't align with, you know, the popular political views or cultural views or whatever. It's just easy to walk away from. And so for me, like going through what I went through in 2014, we can rightfully call it, you know, deconstruction, but there still was a piece of me with Peter, like, man, where else am I going to go? Yep. You alone have the words of eternal life. And so for me, like being able to wrestle with all the other kind of pieces, like the surrounding pieces with Jesus at the center I still was like still able to kind of like stay anchored to him because way, way back in my story, there was a genuine interaction with him, with him. All right, guys. So we're just going to pause right there. This conversation uh, was a good one. It kept going. It wouldn't stop. Um, Definitely a two-parter. So we're going to stop it right there and be looking out for the second half of this conversation next week. Cheers. Cheers.